This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Ulysses by James Joyce. Section 16, Part 2. There ensued a somewhat lengthy pause. One man was reading in fits and starts a stained by coffee evening journal, another the card with the native's posa de, another the seaman's discharge. Mr. Bloom, so far as he was personally concerned, was just pondering in pensive mood. He vividly recollected when the occurrence alluded to take place as well as yesterday, roughly some score of years previously in the days of the land troubles, when it took the civilized world by storm, figuratively speaking, early in the eighties, eighty-one to be correct, when he was just turned fifteen. "'Hey, boss,' the sailor broke in, "'give us back them papers.' The request being complied with, he clawed them up with a scrape. "'Have you seen the rock of Gibraltar?' Mr. Bloom inquired. The sailor grimaced, chewing, in a way that might be read as yes, a, or no. "'Ah, you've touched there, too,' Mr. Bloom said. "'Europa Point,' thinking he had, in the hope that the rover might possibly be some reminiscences. But he failed to do so, simply letting spurt a jet of spew into the store-dust, and shook his head with a sort of lazy scorn. "'What year would that be about?' Mr. B. interrogated. "'Can you recall the boats?' Our soi-disant sailor munched heavily a while hungrily, before answering, "'I'm tired of all them rocks in the sea,' he said, "'and boats and ships, salt junk all the time.' Tired, seemingly, he ceased. His questioner, perceiving that he was not likely to get a great deal of change out of such a wily old customer, fell to wool-gathering on the enormous dimensions of the water about the globe, Suffice it to say that, as a casual glance at the map revealed, it covered fully three-fourths of it, and he fully realized accordingly what it meant to rule the waves. On more than one occasion, a dozen at the lowest, near the North Bull at Dolly Mount, he had remarked a superannuated old salt, evidently derelict, seated habitually near the not particularly redolent sea of the wall. Staring quite obliviously at it, and it at him, dreaming of fresh woods and pastures new, as someone somewhere sings. And he left him wondering why. Possibly he had tried to find out the secret for himself, floundering up and down the antipodes, and all that sort of thing, and over and under, well, not exactly under, tempting the fates. And the odds were twenty to nil. There was really no secret about it at all. Nevertheless, without going into the minutiae of the business, the eloquent fact remained that the sea was there in all its glory, and in the natural course of things, somebody or other had to sail on it and fly in the face of providence, though it merely went to show how people usually contrived to load that sort of onus on to the other fellow, like the hell idea and the lottery and insurance which were run on identically the same lines, so that for every reason, if no other, Lifeboat Sunday was a highly laudable institution to which the public at large, no matter where living inland or seaside, as the case may be, having it brought home to them like that, should extend its gratitude also to the harbour-masters and coast-guard service who had to man the rigging and push off and out amid the elements, whatever the season when duty called, Ireland expects that every man, and so on, and sometimes had a terrible time of it in the winter-time, not forgetting the Irish lights, Kish and others, liable to capsize at any moment, rounding which he once with his daughter had experienced, some remarkably choppy, not to say stormy, weather. There was a fellow sailed with me in the rover, the old sea-dog, himself a rover, proceeded, went ashore and took up a soft job as gentleman's valet, at six quid a month. Them are his trousers I've on me, 
and he gave me an oilskin and that jackknife. I'm game for that job, shaving and brush-up. I hate roaming about. There's my son now, Danny, run off to sea, and his mother got him, took in a draper's in Cork, where he could be drawing easy money. What age is he? queried one hearer, who, by the way, seen from the side, bore a distant resemblance to Henry Campbell, the town clerk, away from the carking cares of office, unwashed, of course, and in a seedy get-up, and a strong suspicion of nose-paint about the nasal appendage. Why, the sailor answered with a slow, puzzled utterance, my son, Danny? He be about eighteen now, way I figure it. The skibbereen father hereupon tore open his great or unclean anyhow shirt with his two hands and scratched away at his chest, on which was to be seen an image tattooed in blue Chinese ink intended to represent an anchor. There was lice in that bunk in Bridgewater, he remarked. Sure as nuts. I must get a wash tomorrow or next day. It's them black lads I objects to. I hate those buggers. Suck your blood dry, they does. Seeing they were all looking at his chest, he accommodatingly dragged his shirt more open, so that on top of the time-honoured symbol of the mariner's hope and rest, they had a full view of the figure sixteen, and the young man's side face looking frowningly, rather. Tattoo, the exhibitor explained. That was done when we were lying becalmed off Odessa, in the Black Sea, under Captain Dalton. Fellow the name of Antonio done that. There he is himself, a Greek. Did it hurt much doing it? One asked the sailor. The worthy, however, was busily engaged in collecting round the, some way in his, squeezing or. See here, he said, showing Antonio. There he is, cursing the mate. And there he is now, he added, the same fellow, pulling the skin with his fingers, some special knack, evidently, and he laughing at a yarn. And in point of fact, the young man named Antonio's livid face did actually look like forced smiling, and the curious effect excited the unreserved admiration of everybody, including Skin the Goat, who this time stretched over. Ay, ay, sighed the sailor, looking down on his manly chest. He's gone too. Et by sharks after. Ay, ay. He let go of the skin so that the profile resumed the normal expression of before. Neat bit of work, one longshore man said. And what's the number for? Loafer number two queried. Eaten alive? A third asked the sailor. Ay, ay, sighed again the letter personage, more cheerily this time with some sort of a half-smile for a brief duration, only in the direction of the questioner about the number, et, a Greek he was, and then he added with rather gallows-bird humour, considering his alleged end, as bad as old Antonio, for he left me on my own yo. The face of a street-walker glazed and haggard under a black straw hat, peered askew round the door of the shelter, palpably reconnoitring on her own, with the object of bringing more grist to her mill. Mr. Bloom, scarcely knowing which way to look, turned away on the moment flusterfied, but outwardly calm, and, picking up from the table the pink sheet of the Abbey Street organ which the Jarve, if such he was, had laid aside, he picked it up and looked at the pink of the paper, though why pink? His reason for so doing was he recognised on a moment round the door the same face he had caught a fleeting glimpse of that afternoon on Ormond Quay, the partially idiotic female, namely, of the lane who knew the lady in the brown costume does be with you, Mrs. B., and begged the chance of his washing. Also why washing, which seemed rather vague than not your washing. Still candour compelled him to admit he had washed his wife's undergarments when soiled in Hall Street, and women would and did too a man's similar garments initialed with Bewley and Draper's marking ink. Hers were, that is. If they really loved him, that is to say, love me, love my dirty shirt. 
Still, just then, being on tenterhooks, he desired the female's room more than her company, so it came as a genuine relief when the keeper made her a rude sign to take herself off. Round the side of the evening telegraph, he just caught a fleeting glimpse of her face round the side of the door, with a kind of demented glassy grin, showing that she was not exactly all there, viewing with evident amusement the group of gazers round Skipper Murphy's nautical chest, and then there was no more of her. "'The gunboat,' the keeper said. "'It beats me,' Mr. Bloom confided to Stephen. "'Medically, I am speaking, how a wretched creature like that from the Lock Hospital, reeking with disease, can be barefaced enough to solicit, or how any man in his sober senses, if he values his health in the least. "'Unfortunate creature! Of course I suppose some man is ultimately responsible for her condition. Still, no matter what the cause is from—' Stephen had not noticed her, and shrugged his shoulders, merely remarking, "'In this country people sell much more than she ever had, and do a roaring trade. Fear not, them that sell the body, but have not power to buy the soul. She is a bad merchant. She buys dear and sells cheap.' The elder man, though not by any manner of means an old maid or a prude, said it was nothing short of a crying scandal that ought to be put to stop to instanter to say that women of that stamp, quite apart from any old maidish squeamishness on the subject, a necessary evil, were not licensed and medically inspected by the proper authorities, a thing he could truthfully state, as a pater familias, was a stalwart advocate of from the very first start. Whoever embarked on a policy of the sort, he said, and ventilated the matter thoroughly, would confer a lasting boon on everybody concerned. You, as a good Catholic, he observed, talking of body and soul, believe in the soul. Or do you mean the intelligence, the brain power as such, as distinct from any outside object? The table, let us say, that cup. I believe in that myself, because it has been explained by competent men as the convolutions of the grey matter. Otherwise we would never have such inventions as X-rays, for instance. Do you? Thus cornered, Stephen had to make a superhuman effort of memory to try and concentrate and remember, before he could say, They tell me on the best authority it is a simple substance and therefore incorruptible. It would be immortal, I understand, but for the possibility of its annihilation by its first cause, who, from all I can hear, is quite capable of adding that to the number of his other practical jokes. Corruptio per se, and corruptio per accidents, both being excluded by court etiquette. Mr. Bloom thoroughly acquiesced in the general gist of this, though the mystical finesse involved was a bit out of his sublunary depth, still he felt bound to enter a demur on the head of simple, promptly rejoining, Simple? I shouldn't think that is the proper word. Of course I grant you to concede a point. You do knock across a simple soul once in a blue moon. But what I am anxious to arrive at is it is one thing, for instance, to invent those rays Röntgen did, or the telescope like Edison, though I believe it was before his time Galileo was the man, I mean, and the same applies to the laws, for example, of a far-reaching natural phenomenon such as electricity, but it's a horse of quite another colour to say you believe in the existence of a supernatural god. Oh, that, Stephen expostulated, has been proved conclusively by several of the best-known passages in Holy Writ, apart from circumstantial evidence. On this knotty point, however, the views of the pair, poles apart as they were, both in schooling and everything else, with a marked difference in their respective ages, clashed. Has been? The more experienced of the two objected, sticking to his original point with a smile of unbelief. I'm not so sure about that. That's a matter for every man's opinion, and without dragging in the sectarian side of the business, I beg to differ with you in toto there. 
My belief is, to tell you the candid truth, that those bits were genuine forgeries, all of them put in by monks, most probably, or it's the big question of our national poet over again, who precisely wrote them like Hamlet and Bacon, as you who know your Shakespeare infinitely better than I, of course I needn't tell you. Can't you drink that coffee, by the way? Let me stir it. And take a piece of that bun. It's one of our skipper's bricks disguised. Still, no one can give what he hasn't got. Try a bit. Couldn't. Stephen contrived to get out, his mental organs, for the moment, refusing to dictate further. Fault-finding being a proverbially bad hat, Mr. Bloom thought well to stir or try to the glotted sugar from the bottom, and reflected with something approaching acrimony on the coffee palace and its temperance and lucrative work. To be sure, it was a legitimate object, and beyond yea or nay did a world of good. Shelters such as the present one they were in run on teetotal lines for vagrants at night. Concerts, dramatic evenings and useful lectures, admittance free, by qualified men for the lower orders. On the other hand, he had a distinct and painful recollection they paid his wife, Madame Marion Tweedy, who had been prominently associated with, at one time, a very modest remuneration, indeed, for her piano-playing. The idea, he was strongly inclined to believe, was to do good and net a profit, there being no competition to speak of. Sulphate of copper, poison, SO4 or something, in some dried peas he remembered reading of in a cheap eating-house somewhere, but he couldn't remember when it was or where. Anyhow, inspection, medical inspection, of all eatables seemed to him more than ever necessary, which possibly accounted for the vogue of Dr. Tibble's vi cocoa on account of the medical analysis involved. "'Have a shot at it now,' he ventured to say of the coffee after being stirred. Thus prevailed on to at any rate taste it, Stephen lifted the heavy mug from the brown puddle it clopped out of, when taken up by the handle, and took a sip of the offending beverage. "'Still it's solid food,' his good genius urged. "'I'm a stickler for solid food, his one and only reason being not gormandizing in the least, but regular meals, as the sine qua non, for any kind of proper work, mental or manual. You ought to eat more solid food.' You would feel a different man. Liquids I can eat, Stephen said. But, oh, oblige me by taking away that knife. I can't look at the point of it. It reminds me of Roman history. Mr. Bloom promptly did, as suggested, and removed the incriminated article, a blunt, horn-handled ordinary knife, with nothing particularly Roman or antique about it to the lay eye observing that the point was the least conspicuous point about it. Our mutual friend's stories are like himself, Mr. Bloom, apropos of knives, remarked to his confidant, sotto voce. Do you think they are genuine? He could spin those yarns for hours on end, all night long, and lie like old boots. Look at him. Yet still, though his eyes were thick with sleep and sea air, life was full of a host of things and coincidences of a terrible nature, and it was quite within the bounds of possibility that it was not an entire fabrication, though at first blush there was not much inherent probability in all the spoof he got off his chest being strictly accurate gospel. He had been, meantime, taking stock of the individual in front of him, and Sherlock Holmesing him up, ever since he clapped eyes on him. Though a well-preserved man of no little stamina, if a trifle prone to baldness, there was something spurious in the cut of his jib that suggested a jail delivery, and it required no violent stretch of imagination to associate such a weird-looking specimen with the oakum and treadmill fraternity. He might even have done for his man supposing it was his own case, he told, as people often did about others, namely that he killed him himself, and had served his four or five good-looking years in durance vile 
to say nothing of the Antonio personage, no relation to the dramatic personage of identical name who sprang from the pen of our national poet, who expiated his crimes in the melodramatic manner above described. On the other hand, he might be only bluffing, a pardonable weakness, because meeting unmistakable mugs, Dublin residents, like those Jarvis waiting news from abroad, would tempt any ancient mariner who sailed the ocean seas to draw the long boat about the schooner Hesperus, and etc. And when all was said and done, the lies a fellow told about himself couldn't possibly hold a proverbial candle to the wholesale whoppers other fellows coined about him. "'Mind you, I'm not saying that it's all pure invention,' he resumed. "'Analogous scenes are occasionally, if not often, met with. Giants, though that is rather a far cry, you see once in a way. "'Marcella, the midget queen. "'In those waxworks in Henry Street, "'I myself saw some Aztecs, as they are called, sitting bow-legged. "'They couldn't straighten their legs if you paid them, "'because the muscles here, you see,' he proceeded, indicating on his companion the brief outline of the sinews, or whatever you like to call them, behind the right knee, were utterly powerless from sitting that way so long cramped up, being adored as gods. There's an example again of simple souls. However, reverting to friend Sinbad and his horrifying adventures, who reminded him a bit of Ludwig, alias Ludwig, when he occupied the boards of the gaiety, when Michael Gunn was identified with the management in the Flying Dutchman. A stupendous success, and his host of admirers came in large numbers, everyone simply flocking to hear him, though ships of any sort, phantom or the reverse, on the stage usually fell a bit flat, as also did trains. There was nothing intrinsically incompatible about it, he conceded. On the contrary, that stab in the back touch was quite in keeping with those Italianos, though, candidly, he was none the less free to admit those ice-creamers and friars in the fish-way, not to mention the chip-potato variety, and so forth, over in Little Italy, there near the coombe, where so were thrifty, hard-working fellows, except perhaps a bit too given to pot-hunting, the harmless necessary animal of the feline persuasion, or others at night so as to have a good old succulent tuck-in, with garlic de rigueur of him, or her, next day on the quiet, and, he added, on the cheap. Spaniards, for instance, he continued, passionate temperaments like that, impetuous as old Nick, are given to taking the law in their own hands, and give you your quietest double-quick, with those poignards they carry in the abdomen. It comes from the great heat, climate generally. My wife is, so to speak, Spanish, half, that is. Point of fact, she could actually claim Spanish nationality if she wanted, having been born in, technically, Spain, that is, Gibraltar. She has the Spanish type. Quite dark, regular brunette black. I, for one, certainly believe climate accounts for character. That's why I asked you if you wrote your poetry in Italian. The temperaments at the door, Stephen interposed with, were very passionate about ten shillings. Roberto ruba roba sua. Quite so, Mr. Bloom dittoed. Then, Stephen said, staring and rambling on to himself or some unknown listener somewhere, we have the impetuosity of Dante and the isosceles triangle Miss Portinari he fell in love with and Leonardo and... San Tommaso Mastino. It's in the blood. Mr. Bloom exceeded at once. All are washed in the blood of the sun. Coincidence, I just happened to be in the Kildare Street Museum today, shortly prior to our meeting, if I can so call it, and I was just looking at those antique statues there. The splendid proportions of hips, bosom. You simply don't knock against those kind of women here. An exception here and there. Handsome, yes, pretty, in a way, you find. But what I'm talking about is the female form. Besides, they have so little taste in dress, most of them, which greatly enhances a woman's natural beauty, 
no matter what you say. Rumpled stockings, it may be, possibly is a foible of mine, but still it's a thing I simply hate to see. Interest, however, was starting to flag out somewhat all round, and then the others got on to talking about accidents at sea, ships lost in a fog, goo collisions with icebergs, all that kind of thing. Ship Ahoy, of course, had its own say to say. He had doubled the cape a few odd times and weathered a monsoon, a kind of wind, in the China seas, and through all those perils of the deep there was one thing, he declared, stood to him, or words to that effect, a pious medal he had that saved him. So then, after that, they drifted on to the wreck of Daunt's Rock, wreck of that ill-fated Norwegian bark. Nobody could think of her name for the moment, till the Jarvey, who had really quite a look of Henry Campbell, remembered it palm on Booter's Town strand. That was the talk of the town that year. Albert William Quill wrote a fine piece of original verse of distinctive merit on the topic for Irish times. Breakers running over her, and crowds and crowds on the shore, in commotion, petrified with horror. Then someone said something about the case of the SS Lady Cairns of Swansea, run into by the Mona, which was on an opposite tack, in rather muggyish weather, and lost with all hands on deck. No aid was given. Her master, the Mona's, said he was afraid his collision bulkhead would give way. She had no water, it appears, in her hold. At this stage an incident happened. It having become necessary for him to unfurl a reef, the sailor vacated his seat. "'Let me cross your bows, mate,' he said to his neighbour, who was just gently dropping off into a peaceful doze. He made tracks heavily, slowly, with a dump sort of a gait to the door, stepped heavily down the one step there was out of the shelter, and bore due left. While he was in the act of getting his bearings, Mr. Bloom, who noticed when he stood up that he had two flasks of presumably ship's rum sticking out of each pocket for the private consumption of his burning interior, saw him produce a bottle and uncork it, or unscrew, and, applying its nozzle to his lips, take a good old delectable swig out of it, with a gurgling noise. The irrepressible Bloom, who also had a shrewd suspicion that the old stager went out on a manoeuvre after the counter-attraction of the shape of a female, or, however, had disappeared to all intents and purposes, could by straining just perceive him, when duly refreshed by his rum puncheon exploit, gaping up at the piers and girders of the loop-line, rather out of his, his depth, as of course it was already radically altered since his last visit, and greatly improved. Some person or persons invisible directed him to the male urinal erected by the cleansing committee all over the place for the purpose but after a brief space of time during which silence reigned supreme, the sailor, evidently giving it a wide berth, eased himself closer at hand, the noise of his bilge-water some little time subsequently splashing on the ground, where it apparently awoke a horse on the cab-rank, a hoof scooped anyway for the new foothold, after sleep and harness jingled. Slightly disturbed in his sentry-box by the brazier of live coke, the watcher of the corporation stones, who, though now broken down and fast breaking up, was none other in stern reality than the Gumley aforesaid, now practically on the parish rates, given the temporary job by Pat Tobin, in all human probability from dictates of humanity, knowing him before shifted about, and shuffled in his box before composing his limbs again on to the arms of Morpheus a truly amazing piece of hard lines in its most virulent form on a fellow most respectably connected and familiarised with decent home comforts all his life, who came in for a cool one hundred pounds a year at one time, which of course the double-barrelled ass proceeded to make general ducks and drakes of. And there he was at the end of his tether, after having often painted the town tolerably pink, 
without a beggarly stiver. He drank needless, to be told, and it pointed only once more, a moral when he might quite easily be in a large way of business if, a big if, however, he had contrived to cure himself of his particular partiality. All meantime were loudly lamenting the falling off in Irish shipping, coastwise and foreign as well, which was all part and parcel of the same thing. A Palgrave Murphy boat was put off the ways at Alexandra Basin, the only launch that year. Right enough the harbours were there, only no ships ever called. There were wrecks and wreckers, the keeper said, who was evidently au fait. What he wanted to ascertain was why the ship ran bang against the only rock in Galway Bay, when the Galway Harbour scheme was mooted by a Mr. Worthington or some name like that, eh? Ask the then captain, he advised them, how much palmoil the British government gave him for that day's work, Captain John Lever of the Lever Line. Am I right, skipper? he queried of the sailor, now returning after his private potation and the rest of his exertions. That worthy, picking up the scent of the fag-end of the song, or words growled in would-be music, but with great vim some kind of chanty or other in seconds or thirds. Mr. Bloom's sharp ears heard him then expectorate, the plug, probably, which it was, so that he must have lodged it, lodged it for the time being in his, f in his fist, while he did the drinking and making water jobs, and found it a bit sour after the liquid fire in question. Anyhow, he rolled it after his successful libation come potation, introducing an atmosphere of drink into the soiree, boisterously trolling like a veritable son of a seacock. The biscuits was as hard as brass, and the beef as salt as Lot's wife's arse. Oh, Johnny Lever, Johnny Lever, oh! After which effusion, the redoubtable specimen duly arrived on the scene, and regaining his seat, he sank rather than sat heavily on the form provided. Skin the goat, assuming he was he, evidently with an axe to grind, was airing his grievances in a forcibly feeble philippic anent the natural resources of Ireland, or something of that sort, which he described in his lengthy dissertation as the richest country bar none on the face of God's earth, far and away superior to England, with coal in large quantities, six million pounds worth of pork exported every year, ten millions between butter and eggs, and all the riches drained out of it by England, levying taxes on the poor people that paid through the nose always, and gobbling up the best meat in the market, and, lo and a lot more surplus steam in the same vein. Their conversation accordingly became general, and all agreed that that was a fact. You could grow any mortal thing in Irish soil, he stated, and there was that Colonel Ever Everard down there in Navan growing tobacco. Where would you find anywhere the like of Irish bacon? But a day of reckoning, he stated crescendo with no uncertain voice, thoroughly monopolizing all the conversation was in store for mighty England, despite her power of pelf on account of her crimes. There would be a fall, and the greatest fall in history. The Germans and the Japs were going to have their little look-in, he affirmed. The Boers were the beginning of the end. Brummagem, England, was toppling already, and her downfall would be Ireland, her Achilles' heel, which he explained to them about the vulnerable point of Achilles, the Greek hero, a point his auditors at once seized as he completely gripped their attention by showing the tendon referred to on his boot. His advice to every Irishman was, stay in the land of your birth, and work for Ireland, and live for Ireland. Ireland, Parnell said, could not spare a single one of her sons. Silence all round marked the termination of this finale. The impervious navigator heard these lurid tidings undismayed. 
Take a bit of doing, boss, retaliated that rough diamond, palpably a bit peeved, in response to the foregoing truism. In which cold douche, referring to the downfall and so on, the keeper concurred, but nevertheless held to his main view. Who is the best troops in the army? the grizzled old veteran irately interrogated. And the best jumpers and racers? And the best admirals and generals we've got? Tell me that. The Irish for choice, retorted the cabby like Campbell, facial blemishes apart. That's right, the old tarpaulin corroborated. The Irish Catholic peasant, he's the backbone of our empire. You know Jem Mullins? While allowing him his individual opinions, as every man the keeper added, he cared nothing for any empire, ours or his, and considered no Irishman worthy of his salt that served it. Then they began to have a few irascible words when it waxed hotter, both, needless to say, appealing to the listeners who followed the passage of arms with interest, so long as they didn't indulge in recriminations and come to blows. From inside information extending over a series of years, Mr. Bloom was rather inclined to pooh-pooh the suggestion as a grudge's balderdash for, pending that consummation devoutly might be to be or not to be wished for, he was fully cognizant of the fact that their neighbours across the channel, unless they were much bigger fools than he took them for, rather concealed their strength than the opposite. It was on a par with the Quixotic idea, in certain quarters, that in a hundred million years the cold seam of the sister island would be played out, and if, as time went on, they turned out to be how the cat jumped all he could personally say on the matter was that, as a host of contingencies, equally relevant to the issue, might occur ere then he was highly advisable in the interim to try to make the most of both countries, even though poles apart. Another little interesting point, the armours of whores and chummies, to put in common parlance, reminded him Irish soldiers had as often fought for England as against her, more so in fact. And now why? So the scene between the pair of them, the licensee of the place rumoured to be or have been Fitzharris, the famous Invincible, and the other, obviously bogus, reminded him forcibly as being on all fours with the confidence trick, supposing, that is, it was pre-arranged as the looker-on, a student of the human soul, if anything, the others seeing least of the game. And as for the lessee or keeper, who probably wasn't the other person at all, he, B, couldn't help feeling that most properly it was better to give people like that the goby, unless you were a blithering idiot altogether, and refused to have anything to do with them as a golden rule in private life, and their felon setting, there always being the off chance of a Danny man coming forward and turning Queen's evidence or King's now like Dennis or Peter Carey, an idea he utterly repudiated. Quite apart from that, he disliked those careers of wrongdoing and crime on principle. Yet, though such criminal propensities had never been an inmate of his bosom in any shape or form, he certainly did feel it no denying it, while inwardly remaining what he was, a certain kind of admiration for a man who had actually brandished a knife, cold steel, with the courage of his political convictions though, personally, he would never be a party to such a thing. Off the same bat as those love vendettas of the South have her swing for her. When the husband frequently, after some words passed between the two concerning her relations with the other lucky mortal, he having had the pair watched, inflicted fatal injuries on his adored one as a result of an alternative post-nuptial liaison by plunging his knife into her, until it just struck him that Fitz, nicknamed Skin the Goat, merely drove the car for the actual perpetrators of the outrage, and so was not, if he was reliably informed, actually party to the ambush, which, in point of fact, 
was the plea some legal luminary saved his skin on. In any case, that was very ancient history by now, and as for our friend, the pseudo skin the etc., he had transparently outlived his welcome. He ought to have either died naturally or on the scaffold high. Like actresses, always farewell positively, last performance, then come up smiling again. Generous to a fault, of course, temperamental, no economizing on any idea of the sort, always snapping at the bone for the shadow. So similarly he had a very shrewd suspicion that Mr. Johnny Lever got rid of some LSD in the course of his perambulations round the docks in the congenial atmosphere of the old island tavern, come back to Erin and so on. Then, as for the other, he had heard not so long before the same identical lingo as he told Stephen how he simply but effectually silenced the offender. He took umbrage at something or other that much injured but on the whole even-tempered person declared, I let slip. He called me a Jew, and in a heated fashion offensively. So I, without deviating from plain facts in the least, told him his God, I mean Christ, was a Jew too, and all his family like me, though in reality I'm not. That was one for him. A soft answer turns away wrath. He hadn't a word to say for himself, as every one saw. Am I not right? He turned a long you-are-wrong gaze on Stephen of timorous dark pride, at the soft impeachment with a glance also of entreaty, for he seemed to glean in a kind of way that it wasn't all exactly. At Quibus, Stephen murmured, mumbled in a non-committal accent, their two or four eyes conversing, Christus, or Bloom, his name is, or, after all, any other, Secundum Carnum. Of course, Mr. B. proceeded to stipulate, you must look at both sides of the question. It is hard to lay down any hard and fast rules as to right and wrong, but room for improvement all round. There certainly is, though every country, they say, distressful included, has the government it deserves but with a little good will all round. It's all very fine to boast of mutual superior superiority, but what about mutual equality? I resent violence and intolerance in any shape or form. It never reaches anything or stops anything. A revolution must come on the due instalments plan. It's a patent absurdity on the face of it to hate people because they live round the corner and speak another vernacular in the next house, so to speak. Memorable bloody bridge battle and seven minutes war, Stephen assented, between Skinner's Alley and Ormond Market. Yes, Mr. Bloom thoroughly agreed, entirely endorsing the remark. That was overwhelmingly right, and the whole world was full of that sort of thing. You just took the words out of my mouth, he said a hocus-pocus of conflicting evidence that candidly you couldn't remotely. All those wretched quarrels, in his humble opinion, stirring up bad blood, from some bump of combativeness or gland of some kind, erroneously supposed to be about a punctilio of honour and a flag, were very largely a question of the money question, which was at the back of everything greed and jealousy, people never knowing when to stop. They accuse, remarked he audibly. He turned away from the others, who probably, and spoke nearer to, so as the others in case they. Jews, he softly imparted in an aside in Stephen's ear, are accused of ruining. Not a vestige of truth in it, I can safely say. History, would you be surprised to learn, proves up to the hilt, Spain decayed when the Inquisition hounded the Jews out, and England prospered when Cromwell, an uncommonly able ruffian who in other respects has much to answer for, imported them. Why? Because they are imbued with the proper spirit. They are practical and are proved to be so. I don't want to indulge in any because, you know, the standard works on the subject and then orthodox as you are. 
but in the economic, not touching religion, domain, the priests spell poverty. Spain again, you saw in the war, compared with Goathead America. Turks, it's in the dogma. Because if they didn't believe they'd go straight to heaven when they die, they'd try to live better. At least so I think. That's the juggle on which the PPs raise the wind on false pretenses. I'm, he resumed with dramatic force, as good an Irishman as that rude person I told you about at the outset, and I want to see everyone, concluded he, all creeds and classes pro rata, having a comfortably tidy-sized income, in no niggard fashion either, something in the neighbourhood of three hundred pounds per annum. That's the vital issue at stake, and it's feasible, and would be provocative of friendlier intercourse between man and man. At least that's my idea for what it's worth. I call that patriotism. Ubi patria, as we learned a smattering of in our classical days, in alma mater, vita bene, where you can live well, the sense is, if you work. Over his untastable apology for a cup of coffee, listening to this synopsis of things in general, Stephen stared at nothing in particular. He could hear, of course, all kinds of words changing colour like those crabs about ring's end in the morning, burrowing quickly into all colours of different sorts, of the same sand where they had a home somewhere beneath or seemed to. When he looked up and saw the eyes that said or didn't say the words, the voice he heard said, if you work. Count me out, he managed to remark, meaning work. The eyes were surprised at this observation, because, as he, the person who owned them pro tem, observed, or rather his voice speaking did, all must work, have to, together. I mean, of course, the other hastened to affirm, work in the widest possible sense. Also literary labour, not merely for the kudos of the thing. Writing for the newspapers, which is the readiest channel nowadays, that's work too, important work. After all, from the little I know of you, after all the money expended on your ex education, you are entitled to recoup yourself and command your price. You have every bit as much right to live by your pen in pursuit of your philosophy as the peasant has. What? You belong to Ireland, the brain and the brawn. Each is equally important. You suspect, Stephen retorted with a sort of a half laugh, that I may be important because I belong to the Faubourg Saint Patrice, called Ireland for short. I would go a step farther, Mr. Bloom insinuated. But I suspect, Stephen interrupted, that Ireland must be important because it belongs to me. What belongs? queried Mr. Bloom, bending, fancying he was perhaps under some misapprehension. Excuse me, unfortunately I didn't catch the latter portion. What was it you? Stephen, patently cross-tempered, repeated and shoved aside his mug of coffee, or whatever you like to call it, none too politely, adding, We can't change the country. Let us change the subject. At this pertinent suggestion, Mr. Bloom, to change the subject, looked down, but in a quandary, as he couldn't tell exactly what construction to put on, belongs to which sounded rather a far cry. The rebuke of some kind was clearer than the other part. Needless to say, the fumes of his recent orgy spoke then with some asperity, in a curious bitter way foreign to his sober state. Probably the home life, to which Mr. B. attached the utmost importance, had not been all that was needful, or he hadn't been familiarised with the right sort of people. With a touch of fear for the young man beside him, whom he furtively scrutinised with an air of some consternation, remembering he had just come back from Paris, the eyes more especially reminding him forcibly of father and sister, failing to throw much light on the subject. However, he brought to mind instances of cultured fellows that promised so brilliantly, nipped at the dub, of premature decay, and nobody to blame for but themselves. For instance, there was the case of a Callaghan, for one, the half-crazy faddist, respectably connected, though of inadequate means, 
with whose mad vagaries, among whose other gay doings when rotto, and making himself a nuisance to everybody all round, he was in the habit of ostentatiously sporting in public a suit of brown paper, a fact. And then the usual denouement, after the fun had gone on fast and furious, he got landed into hot water, and had to be spirited away by a few friends, after a strong hint to a blind horse from John Mallon of Lower Castle Yard, so as not to be made amenable under Section 2 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act, certain names of those subpoenaed being handed in, but not divulged for reasons which will occur to every any one with a pick of brains. Briefly, putting two and two together, six sixteen, which he pointedly turned a deaf ear to, Antonio and so forth, jockeys and aesthetes, and the tattoo which was all the go in the seventies or thereabouts, even in the House of Lords, because early in life the occupant of the throne, then heir apparent, the other members of the upper ten and other high personages, simply following in the footsteps of the head of the state, he reflected about the errors of notorieties and crowned heads running counter to morality, such as the Cromwell case a number of years before, under their veneer in a way scarcely intended by nature, a thing good Mrs. Grundy, as the law stands, was terribly down on, though not for the reasons they thought they were probably. Whatever it was, except women, chiefly, who were always fiddling more or less at one another, it being largely a matter of dress and all the rest of it. Ladies who like distinctive underclothing should, and every well-tailored man must, trying to make the gap wider between them by innuendo, and give more of a genuine fillip to acts of impropriety between the two. She unbuttoned his, and then he untied her. Mind the pin, whereas savages in the cannibal islands, say, ninety degrees in the shade, not caring a continental. However, reverting to the original, there were, on the other hand, others who had forced their way to the top, from the lowest rung by the aid of their bootstraps. Sheer force of natural genius, that, with brains, sir. For which, and further reasons, he felt it was his interest and duty, even, to wait on and profit by the unlooked-for occasion, though why he could not exactly tell, being, as it was, already several shillings to the bad, having in fact let himself in for it. Still, to cultivate the acquaintance of some one of no uncommon calibre, who could provide food for reflection, would amply repay any small. Intellectual stimulation as such was, he felt from time to time, a first-rate tonic for the mind. Added to which was the coincidence of meeting, discussion, dance, row, old sort of the here-to-day-and-gone-tomorrow type, night loafers, the whole galaxy of events, all went to make up a miniature cameo of the world we live in, especially as the lives of the submerged tents, viz. coal miners, divers, scavengers, etc., were very much under the microscope lately. To improve the shining hour, he wondered whether he might meet with anything approaching the same luck of Mr. Billip Beaufoy, if taken down in writing, suppose he were to pen something out of the common groove, as he fully intended doing, at the rate of one guinea per column. My experiences, let us say, in a cabman's shelter. The pink edition extra, sporting of telegraphic lie, lay, as luck would have it, beside his elbow, and he was just puzzling again, far from satisfied, over a country belonging to him, and the preceding rebus, the vessel came from Bridgewater, and the postcard was addressed, A. Boudin, to find the captain's age. His eyes went aimlessly over the respective captains, which came under his special province, the all-embracing give us this day our daily press. First he got a bit of a start, but then it turned out to be only somebody, something about somebody named H. Du Bois, agent for typewriters or something like that. Great Battle, Tokyo. Love-making in Irish. Two hundred pounds damages. Gordon Bennett. 
Emigration swindle. Letter from His Grace. William. Ascot meeting. The Gold Cup. Victory of outsider throwaway recalls Derby of ninety two when Captain Marshall's dark horse, Sir Hugo, captured the blue ribboned at long odds. New York disaster. Thousand lives lost. Foot and mouth. Funeral of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam. So to change the subject, he read about Dignam R.I.P., which, he reflected, was anything but a gay send off. Or a change of address, anyway. End of section sixteen, part two. Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, June two thousand and six.